Okay, so we're gonna. This is best practices for Informix developers. Um, Lester, everybody can hear me. Yes, I can hear you just fine. Great. Um, if you have any questions, uh, pull down the chat box and uh, send them to Lester, and he will collect them and we'll go through them at the end. Um, okay. Uh, that's probably the easiest way to to put your questions down and not forget them. Um, and we'll carry on. Yeah, and, and just a word, the chat box is in the, you should see that in the top right uh, corner of the uh, window. And uh, you can send the chat to either everyone or to uh, to me, and that way I'll collect them for art. Great. So we're going to talk about the different ways to develop applications for Informix uh, very briefly, and then we'll move on to um, some of the best practices and uh, how to avoid bottlenecks and take the best advantage of all the features that Informix has um, for developing applications. Yeah, Art, could you turn your volume up just a little bit, please? I can try. Let's see. How's this? Uh, that's a little bit better. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Hang on one second. Okay, my audio. Okay, my that, audio app was doing a little strange things. Is this okay? That's that it was better just now for a minute. Yes. Okay. Is it worse now? Okay, so um, we'll look we'll look real quick at, at different application development languages that work with Informix. Uh, we'll talk about application performance um, and how to to improve that, um, and we'll talk, take a little quick look at some of the Informix related features um, that have to do with developing applications uh, and that affect what we do. Okay, uh, there we go. So among the application development languages, we have, of course, the Informix uh, development, uh, software development kit, the SDK. Uh, the current version of that is actually 4.10 XC8, I believe. Uh, no, XC4 is still the current, sorry. Um, embedded SQL in COBOL, which is uh, hasn't been maintained in a while, it's still available, but the latest version is 7.25. Uh, uh, there's the uh, Universal driver for JDBC and .NET, uh, which is the uh, uh, driver for DB2. It also works with Informix. Um, for a while, it was the best choice for .NET applications, but if you're using uh, 4.10 XC3 or later, I believe uh, the .NET uh, version that's in the CSDK is actually better than the Universal driver. Uh, it supports a later version of .NET. Um, and it also supports all the informic specific data types, which the uni universal driver does not. Uh, there's the there's EGL, which has you know been around for a little while, enterprise generation language, which was IBM's attempt to replace 4GL. It still exists. Uh, there's uh, very are, few people uh, actually. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. But we're still having problems with the audio. Um, Let me see if I can fix it again. Yeah, if you could go directly into the microphone, I think it's. It sounds like you're you're fading out every once in a while. How's this? That's good. Okay. Um, okay. So other choices are, of course, in compiled 4GL um, and the 4GL Rapid Development System, which is the uh, uh, P Machine version, um, and then Informix SQL or ISQL. We'll take a look at all of these. Okay. Um, in the SDK included is the embedded SQL C compiler and driver and libraries, uh, the CLI or uh, ODBC libraries, uh, the OADB DB driver, uh, the JDBC driver, and the .NET provider. Uh, and also there's a, an object interface for C++, which is no longer actively supported by IBM. Um, but I believe it's still delivered 
with uh, uh, with the SDK. Um, and Form SQL or ISQL includes the Perform Forms Manager, which is a quick and dirty way of putting uh, putting up data display and maintenance forms for for uh, one or two tables. Uh, the ACE Report Writer, uh, which is a kind of quick or GL-like forms, uh, um, forms interface to writing reports, um, and the SQL Menu Manager, which is a way of joining multiple ISQL forms and reports together uh, into a single um, application using using menus. Um, in 4GL, of course, is, there's a native code version which compiles uh, through ESQLC to native machine code, and then there's the, uh, the uh, rapid development system which generates P code for a, for a P interpreter, similar to what Java does for the Java um, Java machine. Okay, um, the latest releases of Informix for GL support uh, web applications or, or web services um, under SOAP. Um, and uh, if you're not familiar with it, for G, it's a for GL is a, a fourth generation language similar to BASIC with some with embedded SQL. It also supports event-driven forms control and event-driven reports, similar to the ISQL forms and, and report modules. Okay. There are also several fourth, third-party 4GL languages uh, that are kind of grouped together as X4GL. Um, there's 4Js, uh, the companies supporting them are 4Js, Quirix, and Aubit. Uh, 4Js has a product called Genero. Uh, Quirix has uh, Product they call ICEA and Aubit 4GL, uh, which is an open source project. Okay. Taking a quick look at these, um, 4G, 4J's Genero is a, a primarily a GUI front end. It runs on Windows, Mac OS X, and Linux. Um, it has full web integration using AJAX and HTML5 and supports SOAP for web services and, and web based components. They also have a, a mobile client. Um, you have to develop your application separately for the mobile client, but they, it's basically 4GL language. Um, you just have to take some care about what uh, features you take advantage of when you want to port your application to mobile. Um, it also includes language extensions, including embedded Java in the code, um, and it works through a virtual machine or a bytecode compiler, uh, similar to the rapid development system, and that means you can deploy an application, once you've written it and compiled it, you can deploy it on any platform, and then it will run um, the uh, runtime machine for, uh, for Genero will, run, will let your application run on any platform without recompiling. It supports also supports, besides Informix, most of the other uh, major develop, um, database systems, uh, although it doesn't do any SQL mapping. So if you want to port your application that you've written in 4GL for Informix to Oracle or uh, um, MS SQL Server, you may have to change some of the SQL. Uh, it includes a graphical report writer and uh, a graphical IDE that's tailored to 4GL. It's Eclipse-like, but it is a proprietary IDE. Okay. They also have an option to, to purchase a 4GL code generator, uh, similar to the 4Gen uh, code generators that were available in the past. Okay. Um, Quirix's 4GL language, as I mentioned, is called Lycia. The current version is Lycia 2. Uh, the development workbench is Eclipse-based. Um, it has a, comes with a window builder, which is a graphical form designer. Um, so you're not writing necessarily writing 4GL forms. Um, in the old way, it will import 4GL forms and, and bring them into the window builder. Uh, so you can use your existing forms. You don't have to start from scratch. Um, it comes with certain productivity tools. Uh, it works with CVS. It works with BERT and Jasper report writers. Those are the report writers that it, it supports and comes with, in addition to 4GL reports. Um, it work, it con contains an ESQLC compiler so that you can uh, write embedded SQLC um, and port it with, their, uh, with your 4GL code and link it together. Um, it also supports, uh, like 4J's Genero, it supports most other relational database systems. It does do dynamic SQL dialect conversion, which is not perfect, but um, may save you from having to rewrite some of your SQL if you port to a different database. It supports web, uh, Java, SOAP, and REST, um, .NET, 
and, and SaaS integration. So it works with most of the um, most of the web um, protocols that will allow it to produce for produce forms on the web. Um, it, the report writers, as I mentioned, are BERT and Jasper. It comes with both, and it's integrated with them. If you're already familiar with one or the other, you can use that. Um, it includes own, its own language extensions, but it also supports the full Gennaro uh, extension set. Um, it, they have multiple graphical thin clients for desktop and for web um, and for mobile. Uh, in general, um, your apps will run on mobile without modification. Um, and it's really easy to write web services uh, in Lycia versus uh, classic 4GL. You just have to rename your function web underscore or whatever you want to call it or wrap the existing function in a new function called web, web underscore. And uh, you can exp that will automatically port it as a web function and make it uh, displayable in a browser. Um, very easy. Audit 4GL is the open source version of 4GL. Again, it supports most rapid, most uh, relational databases. Um, it has very good 4GL compati source compatibility, as do Gennaro and Lycia. Um, it supports character XML and GUI interfaces. Uh, it has its own PDF-based report writer. Uh, it has its own language extensions um, to, to give it even more flexibility for developing graphical applications. Uh, you can embed C and ES2LC in the code. Um, as you can with Lycia and Gennaro. Um, it has, uh, does have dynamic SQL conversion, um, and that's customizable. There's a set of uh, config files that you can use to modify the way it converts SQL. Um, so again, you may not have to rewrite some of your SQL if you're porting. Uh, it is open source and free to develop and distribute. There is commercial support available uh, from Wabit. Um, and uh, it comes with many tools, including an ISQL-like forms and reports um, environment that you can compile and run. It's all written in 4GL. Uh, it comes with a portable DB access clone, although the latest versions of the CSDK uh, do um, deliver with DB access for your client machines, um, which is fairly new. Okay. Um, Informix is also supported by many scripting languages. Uh, there's Perl with the DBD DBI interface uh, that Jonathan Leffler still maintains. Uh, hey, uh, Art, uh, yeah. before we go, we're, the volume is really fading in and out. I'm, and it's, yeah, it's, the only microphone I have. well, it's almost like you're moving away, back and forth, closer and away from the microphone. I'm right here. Um, okay, folks, I'm sorry about the audio, but we'll we'll keep giving it a try. I'm sorry. How am I right now? Uh, you're good right now. Okay. We'll try and but keep it's, it it's, it's been fading in and out, and there are a lot of comments about that. I'm sorry, guys. Um, my headset went on the fritz this morning, and so I'm, I'm stuck with the built-in microphones. Um, okay. Um, anyway, other scripting environments, uh, Informix works with Ruby. There is a Ruby library support for Informix. There's PHP support in Python, and even Go um, supports Informix as a database. Um, you also, Informix also comes, version 12 comes with a MongoDB wire listener, um, so you can use any mean stack applications uh, to talk to an Informix database, whether you're accessing JSON uh, tables or regular relational tables, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, there are also library level uh, APIs for C and C++ and C pound, et cetera. Uh, so anything that talks to Mongo can also talk to Informix. Um, so you're not limited to the traditional Informix environments for development. Okay. Um, there's also a REST protocol listener, um, and that will allow you to write with into the right applications to run on Informix with any development tool that supports HTML. Okay. So let's go on and get to what we started, what we came to talk about, kind of a, a review. When you're inserting a large number of rows into Informix, it's always best. Uh, you have basically have three choices. You can have a singleton insert, 
uh, that you you know generate one for each row, insert, insert, insert. Uh, you can have a prepared insert statement with replaceable parameters that you execute over and over again, um, replacing the values with different values. Or the best choice is to have create an insert cursor, or what's called a put cursor. Um, and as it shows here, you declare a cursor for your insert statement with replaceable parameters, open the cursor, and then in a loop, uh, exec SQL put. So you do a put on the cursor name for, with the variables for each record. Uh, that gets buffered um, in the application in the library, and when the buffer fills up or when you manually execute an SQL flush, uh, the buffer gets pushed to the database. Um, if you're flushing with every record, it's the same as, as doing a, um, an execute of a prepared statement over and over again. But if you let the buffer fill, um, that can run much faster as you're pushing large numbers of records with a single network communication. Okay. After the flush, which either happens automatically or when, you manu when the buffer fills or when you um, do an exec SQL flush, um, SQL CA structure will return the number of records that were actually flushed. So you can check after each put, and it will usually return zero because the record is going into the um, is going into the, the buffer, um, but it, and not being flushed. At some point, you'll see the buffer flush, and the SQL exec, SQL CA, SQL ERD sub two will return the number of records that were flushed. Okay. Um, you can increase the performance of your insert cursors um, by increasing the size of that flush, that um, put cursor, that put buffer. The default buffer size is 4K, uh, and it can vary from 4, 4K up to uh, um, up to two gigabytes. Okay, uh, and you can set that with the environment variable set underscore buff underscore size. There's also a global variable in ESQLC called set, set buff size but that's still only a 16-bit value, so um, IBM has never increased the size of that, so you have to use the environment variable if you want to set up a, a communication buffer size that's wider than 32K. Um, what's called an upsert or a merge operation, if you have, you have input data and you're not sure whether the input record is going, already exists in the database, and will, can be updated or whether it doesn't exist and has to be inserted. Uh, keep in mind that failed updates are cheap and failed inserts are expensive. Um, when you insert a record that already exists, the record has to actually be inserted into, a, into the table, has to be written to a page, the page has to be written to the buffer cache, uh, and then all of the indexes have to be updated until we come to a, to a unique index that causes the insert to fail. Um, a primary key or even a secondary key that causes the insert to fail. Uh, when that happens, then the entire operation has to be undone, has to be rolled back. And that's expensive also. So it's sometimes cheaper to do the in update, even if the record doesn't exist, and see if it fails. The rule of thumb that I use is if 70% of the operations are going to end up being um, updates, then it's always better to try the update first, okay? Uh, if the, you do, do the update and the SQL CA structure says zero records were updated because it's not an error to, end, to update no rows, um, according to the ANSI standards. So the only way you know is the number of rows that were affected in the SQL CA structure will be zero. Um, if that count, row count is zero, then you go do the insert. If 70% or more um, are going to be inserts, then try the insert first. If it's less than 70% being inserts, then try the update first, and that typically works better. Um, almost always the worst thing you can do is to select the record and then decide whether to insert or update based on whether or not you get a record back. That will almost always be slower uh, than either doing the inserts first and letting them fail or doing the updates first and, and seeing that nothing got updated. Okay. You can also use the new merge operation, uh, the uh, SQL merge statement, which kind of looks like this. Um, you would uh, load your, your, temp, your data file into a temp table or use an external table and merge into data table using your staging table, okay? Using your staging table, um, match on the key columns, and then when matched, update. When not matched, <laughs>
Um, if you're not hearing in, in, please mute yourself. yourself. You're not echoing back. Um, okay, our next subject is lock contention. Uh, one of the biggest things that can affect performance of an application is lock contention. Uh, and one of the best ways to avoid lock contention is to use what we call optimistic locking uh, protocols. Um, and what we call them optimistic because we make the assumption that no two users normally will be modifying the same row at the same time, right? Sometimes that's a perfectly good assumption, sometimes it's not. Um, an example of when it will tend to work um, is like an insurance application, right? In an insurance company, some only one person is going to be working on a case at a time. And it's unlikely that more than one person will work on a particular case at a time. Um, the other, the all opposite to the opposite condition would be like a banking application, right? It's entirely possible for myself and my wife to go to ATMs in different cities at, at nearly the same time and try and get money out of our account. Um, and that's a, a possibility. And so we need to make sure that, that we don't clash. So if it happens that two people are modifying the same record at the same time, then we need to deal with it at that point. And that's the basis of optimistic locking is assume that nobody's going to do that. Uh, they're only going to be one updater at a time. And then at some point decide before committing the row, whether or not the record has been changed by somebody else uh, and then commit the change. Okay. And that reduces lock contention tremendously because we don't lock the record immediately, right? Um, in the, the inverse of this or pessimistic locking, you lock the row right away because pessimistically you're going to assume that somebody else might try to update the row, so we want to lock them out. Uh, and that causes much higher lock contention than an optimistic protocol. Um, so the way we do that, okay, There we go. So the way we do that is to fetch the row without a lock. So don't use an, a for update clause. Um, that way, if the user pulls the record up on his desktop and goes out for lunch, you don't have a record that's locked for an hour or worse, goes away for the weekend and you have a record that's locked for three or four days. Um, present the copy of the row for the user to modify. Fetch the current stored version of the row with a lock after the user has changed the data. So the user gets the record, we put it on the screen, we don't lock it. We let the user play with the record and make whatever changes he needs to make. And then when we're ready to update the record, we have all of the user's changes in hand. Uh, we can, in a, in a few fractions of a second, we can complete this operation. Then we fetch the record again with a for update clause, uh, preferably with a for update of current. So we have a lock on the record and we can update it very quickly. Validate that their user, that no other user has changed the record since we last fetched it and presented it to our user. And if there are no changes, update and commit. If there are other changes, then roll back the use this user's work and notify them that the record's been changed by somebody else and let them try again. That's kind of the way it works. Um, there are several ways to implement it. One way, uh, and what we did we did before we had some support in the database for this kind of operation was to include a date time, kind of a timestamp column, call it date time year to fraction five, okay, the best resolution we can get. Um, and include a default so that the insert will always populate the record when it's inserted and an update trigger so that the that column will always be modified when the row is changed, okay. And then when we go to refetch the data to validate that it hasn't been modified, we only have to, we only have to fetch the timestamp column. We don't have to fetch the entire record and we don't have to check every column. We just have to check that the timestamp has not been modified. Um, and a note at the bottom, if you see it, um, is the resolution from the Informix current verb if you have used OS time set to one in the onconfig file. By default, it's set to zero. Okay, so you, in order to get sub-second resolution, you have to turn that on um, either using on mode minus W or by changing the onconfig file and bouncing your server. Okay? Your actual resolution is going to depend on the operating system and, and your processor architecture. Uh, the worst is probably Solaris, um, and the best that I know of is, is AIX on power. Uh, gives the finest re resolution. Linux is pretty good also. Version two of this is to use CR calls in every table. Uh, the CR calls were added 
to Informix for enterprise replication. It adds two columns to the table, a CDR server, which is the name of the server that, uh, well, actually the number of the server that modified the record last, and CDR time, which is the time the record was last modified. So this is an automatically maintained change date or change time um, that's maintained by the engine. Um, and you can also add a REPL check column to the table. That's one way, not a recommended way, but it did work when we, when we first got this capability. Version three, um, and we have vercals. Ver vercals were added to the engine. That in, it inserts two hidden columns, IFX insert checksum and IFX row version. The IFX insert checksum is only, chain, only set when a row is inserted. Um, and the IFX row version is the version number of the row. Uh, that's incremented every time the record is changed after it's inserted. So by checking those two columns, you can see, tell if the record has been deleted and reinserted um, or if it's been updated in place. One of those two columns will be different um, in the version, uh, in the new version of the record. So you can you only have to fetch those two columns to check. Uh, and if you fetch them with lock, you're good to go for update. Okay, um, another thing you can do to reduce lock contention is to use the last committed option to committed read isolation. Um, that will um, fetch for you the last committed version of a record, even if someone is working on the record and has it locked. Uh, again, you still have to check afterwards when you're ready to commit yourself um, a particular record, whether or not the record is their application. The other application uh, or the other user may have fetched the record for update and, and rolled it all back. Okay, so you may be good to go, but you have to check. All right. Um, however, if you have a badly behaved application that doesn't check, you're more likely to, to uh, be updating bad data. Okay, so it's very important if you use last committed option um, to your isolation level that you use optimistic locking protocols and check everything. Another way you can increase the speed of your rec of your applications if they deal with large numbers of records is to take advantage of an Informix feature called array fetching. Okay. When Informix returns data to your application, it always sends a buffer full of rows. It doesn't send a single row. So when you do a fetch in your ESQLC application or your ODBC application um, or Java app, it doesn't matter, um, the library gets back a buffer that's at least 4K in size, that contains a number of records. And then when you do a fetch, each fetch, the library is deblocking or, or breaking up that buffer full of records into single records and returning them to your um, application's code space, okay? Uh, there's a lot of overhead to doing that, to writing generic code that can deblock any record that comes through the, uh, from the engine. So it may be that you can do a better job yourself. Okay, so what you do is you, by turning on array fetching, and I'll show you how that's done in a minute, you get that entire block of rows into your application's memory space where you can work with it and play with that array, okay, or those arrays. It returns one array for each column that you're fetching uh, in the projection clause. And you can deblock it more efficiently than the Informix libraries can most of the time because you know what the data is when you, can, when you wrote your application. Uh, and that's generally faster. Uh, the only one caveat, there's a bug in the, in the uh, CSDK that IBM has not fixed yet, uh, as of the latest version that I'm aware of. Um, you can't do array fetching with any re anything that returns LVAR cares. You'll get an 1831 error, which is a whole different, it's, it's, it's a bogus error. Um, it's complaining about using array fetch with, um, um, with reprepare or something like that, and which has nothing to do with the problem. The problem is returning LVAR cares um, in an array fetch. So that hasn't been fixed yet. Um, so what do you do? Um, you set FET buff size or, or the environment variable FET underscore buff underscore size large enough so that your, so the buffer communicating between the engine and your application will hold a large number of rows. In your application, there's a global variable FET array size in ESQLC um, that you set to the number of rows that fit in that buffer, okay? And if you get it wrong, the engine, will be, the library will adjust um, the FET array size to actually fit the buffer. Um, you just have to be careful not to make it smaller. 
if you make it too big, it, the engine will adjust it or the library will adjust it. Um, and then you just prepare and describe your query uh, into an SQL DA um, descriptor, descriptor func uh, structure um, and update the structure with a pointer to memory to hold an array of values for each column. Okay, I'm going to show you the code in a second. And then you just do a fetch using the SQL DA structure. Uh, and then pull the data out of out of the array. So you, the first element of each array will be contain the first row. The second element of each array combined contains the second row, et cetera. And it looks something like this. So set buff, buff size to 32765. Set, uh, set fetch array size to set buff size divided by the row width. Right. Prepare my statement. So here we're selecting tab ID and tab name from sys tables. Um, and then describe my statement into SQLDA underscore structure. Uh, and then for each SQL data substructure in the SQL var structure, um, we assign, we do a malloc to allocate memory for that column of data um, that has fed array size number of elements in it. Okay, so each uh, tab ID is an int, each uh, tab name is a, is a a CAR 128, but we need room for the null value, um, so we make it 129. And now we can just do exec SQL declare cursor and exec SQL open cursor. And then at fetch time in the loop, okay, um, at the beginning I'm setting an, a, a pointer tab ID, which is a pointer to int, to point to the array of, of SQL data that's going to get returned with my tab IDs. And I set tab NM. Uh, which is a pointer to an array of 129 character strings um, to my SQL DA that was allocated for the tab name. And then fetch my curse using descriptor colon SQL DA underscore STR. Um, and if, like usual, if SQL code is 100, there are no more records, I can break. Um, and actually, you, you want to actually process the, uh, the records that are in the array. So we check them, SQL ERD sub two tells us how many rows were returned, and we can loop on that and process the data for each row. Okay, that's returned. There are a couple of optimizations you can take advantage of that are controlled outside of your application by environment variables. Um, one is uh, deferred prepare. Okay, uh, you can either use the SQL command set to prepare enabled um, or in your environment export IFX defer prepared uh, prepare equals one uh, and set that variable either way uh, what that does is it defers the actual operation of a prepare statement until you execute the, the statement or, or open a cursor against it or declare a cursor against it so when you execute the prepare it will always return an SQL code of zero because it doesn't do anything except make a note that it has to prepare the statement later uh, and then when you do, when you open a cursor or uh, um, or execute the statement uh, ID that came back, uh, at that point it will actually prepare the statement. Um, so you need to move some of your error checking around. If you do this, instead of error checking after the prepare, you have to error check after the open or the execute um, more rigorously. Okay. Um, it can reduce the number of round trips between the application and the server. Not much gain if you take a statement and prepare it once and reuse it many times, um, but um, um, okay. But uh, since the prepare doesn't happen until you open it, then describes have to be executed after the open, not after the prepare. Okay. Um, okay. Also, any any syntax errors, undefined object errors, things like that, um, will not show up until you open. And they won't show up at the SQL prepare. Okay. And as noted by the 1831 error, which was bogus before, you will get that same error if you try and do a deferred prepare and a fetch with a fetch array while deferred prepare is, is enabled. So you can't use them together. Okay. The next one is open fetch close optimization. You can set the environment variable OPT OFC equals one and then enables open fetch close optimization, um, which defers the actual opening of the cursor until the first fetch. Okay, so the cursor is not, nothing happens when you declare and open the cursor, 
when you execute the first spec statement, there the cursor is actually created and opened. Okay. Also, the cursor will automatically close when the cursor has been drained. So when you fetch the last record uh, and the next record would return a, an SQL code of 100, that's when the cursor gets closed automatically. You don't have to, exec you don't have to execute a closed cursor. Okay. Um, you can also def combine deferred prepare and uh, open fetch close optimization, in which case nothing happens until the first fetch. Okay. Um, so, if, so if you're doing dynamic SQL, your describes then would have to follow the fetch uh, and not the uh, prepare or the open. Okay, kind of weird, and that's kind of a little late in my mind to be describing your statement, but that's the way it works. Okay, um, again, you can't use fetch array with open fetch close optimization. Okay. Also, closing the cursor since it closes automatically, it will also be freed. And that means you can't reopen the cursor. You have to go redeclare it. Um, so you, some of your, you can't just turn this on um, and expect your application to continue to work the, the way they currently do. Um, some of your semantics have to, may have to be changed in the way your applications work. Um, but it can be faster. Okay. Um, simple large objects. So we're talking about text and byte type columns. Okay, you have three options when you fetch the data or for a text or a byte column or when you insert data to fetch to text or byte. And those are fetch to memory or insert from memory, fetch to a file or a file descriptor or insert from a file or a file descriptor, and fetch using a use, what are called user defined user functions. Okay, uh, where you define a set of open, read or write and close functions um, to process the data uh, and hand it to the, to the engine. Okay. Um, it turns out that the slowest of these is fetching a memory, and the fastest is using user-defined functions uh, with using files or file descriptors somewhere in between. Uh, kind of counterintuitive, but that's the way it works in every time I've tested it for many years. So here's how you do, um, do fetches of, of blob data with user-defined functions. Okay? Describe the structure, the statement, and you get your, your SQL DA structure. In the SQL DA structure um, for the blob column, there'll be a loc T structure. Okay. Um, you set the loc, loc type field in the loc T structure for the blob column to loc underscore user. That's a define. Okay. And you also need to create a loc, loc open function and a loc read function for inserts or a loc write function for selects. Kind of the names are counterintuitive. Right, I would think you read to select and write to insert, but it's not, it goes the other way around. Um, and you need a close find a low close function to clean up and finalize blob handling for inserts. Um, so what you need to do looks something like this. Um, this would be an, is an open open function. This is actually the open function from my DB copy utility. Looks very simple, doesn't have to do much, sets up some some data structure that I use in the application, okay. Um, this is the write it function, which is used to fetch data for a blob out of the database, okay. Um, here we just basically passes in, the loc T structure gets passed in by the engine, um, a buffer pointer containing uh, a number of bytes from the, from the blob, and the and, and n bytes contains the number of bytes that were transferred. It almost always transfers 2K of data. Um, except for the last bit, um, but you need to check that. So what I've done here is I'm using dpods and n bytes uh, to decide whether I have to expand my internal buffer that contains the blob data. Um, so you might see, you see a realloc there if the, if the data is bigger than the buffer I already have, from let's say a previous record. Um, okay, I keep track of how many rec how many bytes are being read. Okay, from the loc underscore x for count in the loc t structure. Um, all right. And then copy the data into my own buffer out of the incoming buffer uh, with the mem copy. Uh, do a little housekeeping and return the number of records, number of bytes that I processed, uh, which should be the number of bytes that were read. Okay. If not, you'll get an error. All right. A readed function looks similar. This is how we input data. Right, I'm just here just use memcopy to copy the data out of my buffer and into the buff pointer that was passed in by the engine or by the library. 
um, keep track of where I am positioned uh, in my structure for the next the next time read it is called and read it or write it will be called over and over again until the entire blob is transferred uh, and then the engine will call the close it function and that just does internal clean up the engine doesn't care really what you do here um, but you just clean up your own data structures and get ready for the next record uh, if it's a multi-record fetch. Okay. Setting up the loc t structure looks like this. We set loc type, loc underscore loc type to loc user, set the size of the transfer buffer, loc underscore buff size equals 4096 in this case. Um, loc buffer equals blob buff. That's my pointer to my buffer. Okay. And then set loc write to the write it function or loc read to the read it function. Uh, and then set loc open and loc close to your open and close function. And that's all you have to do. For blobs and clobs, your smart large objects are a set of library functions that deal with the same kinds of things. Uh, they already exist, um, and they will process an entire blob or a subset of the blob. Uh, you can use the IFX low read with seek uh, to get data back from a, uh, from a slob um, with, uh, from a particular subset of the, of the blob um, and fetch back some of the data. I'm not going to go into detail detail about that. Um, so we'll talk, let's talk a little bit about SPL. Um, SPL stored procedure language is very efficient um, for running SQL, but it's not particularly efficient or fast for doing complex calculations um, or for running deeply nested uh, function calls. If you're calling uh, either recursively or non-recursively more than four or five levels deep, um, the SPL will start to get slow. Um, so you need to carefully plan um, how your stored procedures are, are structured and how they call each other um, if you're getting into more complex um, sets of uh, nested or, or related functions, okay? Uh, dynamic SQL and stored procedures work particularly well. Uh, they're just as fast as, as non-dynamic um, queries, um, so don't shy away from them. Now you can do your prepares and your declares, cursors, and, and process the cursor inside the function um, or procedure. Okay. Um, stored procedures that process large amounts of data and filter out the data, uh, returning only what the application needs, um, can be a big game. That's the, the most important place to use stored procedures is to reduce the amount of data that has to be returned to the application. Okay. Um, you can also use them to concatenate multiple rows into a single record, things like that, or break or break data up into smaller records. Um, a lot of things like that will improve your performance of your application um, or help make the data look more like uh, the structure that the application wants to see. Uh, and those are ways that, that using stored procedure language will help you a lot. Using it to do a lot of complex calculations is probably a bad idea. And those things should probably be written in, if you want to move them into the server and write them as UDTs, as UDFs, user-defined functions, and then you want to write them in Java or in C okay. or ESQLC. Um, disconnecting the application from the data. When I was learning programming, right, we were, the hot buzzwords were, were structured programming. And the thing that we wanted, we talked about a lot was disconnecting um, the application from the data uh, in such a way that you didn't have dependencies between modules. If the more dependencies there are between modules, the more uh, within the code you had a possibility of making changes in one place, causing errors and bugs in some completely different place uh, and making in life difficult to debug. The same thing happens between an application and the database and the schema, okay? So what we want to do is, as much as possible, disconnect the application and its view of the data from the database's view of the data. And that allows us to change the schema and hide those changes from the application and from the client code as much as possible, um, okay? It's very important, especially for mobile applications where you may have multiple versions of your app uh, out in the field all at the same time, and yet your schema is changing under the hood. The more we disconnect that app uh, from the schema, the easier life gets. Uh, when I was at Bloomberg, we moved 
code twice a week. Uh, and we were only able to do that because we were very careful to make sure that there was very little connection between the schema and the application. The application had its view of the data, the schema had its view of the data, and in between um, we had a layer of middleware that, that hid one from the other. Okay, so we could update the schema. I could update the schema on Friday, and when new code moved on Saturday, uh, everything was fine. And if it didn't move on Saturday, it was no big deal, because we already knew it was still working on Friday. Um, same thing would happen every Wednesday when we moved fixes to, to bugs that were moved on Saturday, um, and some new code as well. Okay. Um, carefully written dynamic SQL can help you to do that. One of the things that you can do, um, dynamic SQL determines the types and the number of columns at runtime. And so it can produce a more uh, flexible application on the application side. But if you don't do it carefully, it can also create even more um, linkage or, or, or coherent or connectivity between the schema and the application uh, in a different way, right? If you're Dynamic SQL return is it is returning seven columns and the schema changes so that it only detects six columns now. Um, your code needs to be flexible enough to say, oh, I only got back these six columns. I didn't get back that one. I have to put a default in that um, element of the data structure, um, or your application is going to break. So yes, it can. It's one way that you can make your applications more flexible. It's also a new way to break them if you're not careful. Um, this is a chart I put together many years ago, um, and it goes from, from one to, to five, from the lowest level of interdependency to the highest level of interdependency. Um, if all of your SQL and related business logic is encapsulated in stored procedures, right, and they're, all, and they're returning data structures that are mapped to your application, then changing the schema is easy. You change the schema, you change the stored procedure, the application doesn't have to change. Right? If the application changes, we write a new stored procedure to return the new version of the data structure, and the schema doesn't necessarily have to change, right? or it can, but it doesn't have to. And we don't have to worry that we have to move schema changes in lock sync with application changes. Okay? If the application has to move before the schema moves, um, that's not an issue. Right? As long as we move one and we have the, the mappings in place in the stored procedures or somewhere, then everything will continue to work. And if we have to roll something back, if the application has to roll back, that's going to continue to work with the old version of the stored procedure. Okay. Same thing with middleware. If you can encapsulate your business logic in middleware, that disconnects the application from the database again, and all the interdependencies exist in the middleware. And again, we don't have to necessarily move schema changes in lockstep with the application. Okay. Um, so moving on. And that's about it. I think we're ready for questions. Art, right, can you see the chat? I'm pulling it up now. Okay. Um, there are some at the very beginning, so you may want to scroll back to the beginning. Um, I'm seeing only first, from the, the ones about audio. Uh, uh, first one uh, is from Ernie about uh, SQL exec. Let me see if I can copy that for you. Um, Okay. Okay. Um, uncommented DP class. And I, I'm not sure I quite understand the question myself. That's why I sent you the whole text. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like, Ernie, it sounds like you, um, you moved uh, your Java processor into a separate DP, and now you're getting execute errors. Um, I assume that's SQL code 25791. Um, 
So that extend role or built in job routine install jar. Yeah, I'm not sure where that error is coming from. Um, I'm making a note to myself. I'll look, at, I'll look that up for you, and I'll let you know what I find out. Okay. Anything else? So any other questions, folks? Just put them in the chat, please. I think that's it, Art. All right. So I want to thank uh, Lester and, and Advanced Data Tools for, for providing this forum for us. Um, and uh, Lester, I think you, you know when the, you, you're starting to plan out the next uh, uh, of our webcasts. Yeah, let me, uh, can I bring up a slide? Um, before I do, there's, this last slide has Art's contact information. And uh, we will uh, try and put uh, this presentation up on YouTube with our other presentations uh, that have been done over the last four or five years. Uh, it'll probably take a couple of days because uh, I want to I want to see if I can get the audio smoothed out a little bit. Um, let me uh, talk about the next. Uh, Okay, our next uh, webcast is going to be on March 24th. You should see uh, information on on the screen about it. Uh, one of my favorite uh, topics is the SysMaster database, and I'll be doing an update on it uh, with some new uh, tips and uh, tricks that uh, I've picked up over the last uh, year. And um, so please uh, set up registration. You can go join right now um, if you go to our website. Uh, and I uh, look forward to uh, seeing everybody uh, on March uh, 24th uh, at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, anyway, thank you all. And uh, thank you, Art, uh, for doing this. And uh, we'll... Uh, talk to you again. And again, I'll send out information as soon as we have the slides and the YouTube video recording of this uploaded.